Boker Tov. Good morning. Buenos días. I am Roberto Null, president of the Argentina Friends of the Hebrew University. And welcome all of you to the first academic panel of the Board of Governors. This year, the theme, Genesis, Origins of the Universe and Humankind, is the subject, the cross subject for a couple of events. And you will have the opportunity to listen in the five events during the Board of Governors, to listen to 18 Hebrew University professors in five different occasions. I review the subjects and I am impressed, and I hope you will be impressed too, for the breadth and depth of the contents prepared by the university and the professors. This morning, we will have the first of this session that will be a panel discussion under the subtitle, The Big Bang and the Birth of the Universe. We will have the pleasure of hearing from four distinguished professors of the Hebrew University, Professor Avishai Dekel, Professor Riem Sari, Professor Jair Sakovic, and Professor Rachel Elior. The mechanics of this meeting will be each professor will speak 30 minutes, and after the first two speakers, we will have time for raising questions. Later on, we will have a short break, and the second part will be the other two professors, and again, time to raise questions after they finish their own presentation. And finally, we'll, make, uh, we'll end, hopefully, 12.30. So let me introduce the first professor. And he is uh, Avishai Dekel, and I will read an extract of his CV. Uh, Avishai was uh, born in Jerusalem. Uh, he is a bachelor science and philosophical doctor uh, in physics. Uh, he has a postdoc in Caltech. Uh, and uh, he also called Andre Eisenstadt Chair of Theoretical Physics 2007 up to today. He is specialized in theoretical physics, astrophysics, and cosmology, and uh, teaches, obviously, physics, science, and I was surprised also what they, he called popularization. So I may guess that is prepared to this difficult subject to make more available to people like me. Um, he main scientific contributions, uh, the main one is the standard model for supernova feedback and the formation of dwarf galaxies. His recent major duties include, he's the president of Israel Physical Society since 2007, and leader of the Center for Understanding of the Universe since 2000. Uh, he worked with uh, more than 19 postdoc students and other students, and got a lot of, or more than 20 competitors research program funds. So, Mr. Avishai Dekel, it's a pleasure. Can you hear me now? 
Thank you. Um, I'm going to tell you about the Big Bang, the scientific version of the creation of the universe. And I'm going to start with what the method of science starts with, namely making an assumption or assumptions to obey the simplicity uh, methodology of, of science. Uh, one of them, for example, is that the laws of nature are the same everywhere at, at all times, a daring assumption which we might, must make before we even start. And then we make the assumption that the universe is homogeneous on uh, large scales. And this comes from looking at the sky, counting galaxies, and observing the fact that statistically, there is no difference between the different directions. They all look the same, the galaxies, they uh, count the same. And this is the modern version of this, coming from the cosmic microwave background radiation, one of the biggest discovery of cosmology of the previous century. Uh, this is the signal from the edge of the observable universe, almost 14 billion light years away. And what I wanted to pay attention here is that this signal, even though you see the fluctuations, they are smaller than one in 100,000. This means it's isotropic. There is no specific direction. And from this observation, we make the leap into the assumption that every observer in the universe is the same, and it's really homogeneous. Once we assume, namely, there's no specific special place that we live in or any other observer lives in. Once we make this assumption, the results are overwhelming, the consequences. Because, for example, if you assume that the geometry is Euclidean, what we call the flat universe, then I'm arguing, if this is a piece of my universe, that the universe must be infinite in size. The reason being that if there was any edge here, at this edge, there would have been different observations at different directions. So it must extend forever. But you can change this conclusion if you're willing to give up the Euclidean nature of geometry in which parallel lines never meet. For example, you can close and assume the universe is this two-dimensional surface around a sphere, and then you can have, it's a curved space, in the sense that you see those parallel lines here at the equator are actually meeting up here. The sum of angles in a triangle is more than 180 degrees. But in this case, this face is finite in area. Now, I'm plotting two dimensions just because that's what our mind can grasp. But think about it as three-dimensional surfaces. And in this case, it's finite. The number of galaxies is finite. The number of people is simply finite, and so on. So we have those two options, and we would have liked to know which one is our universe. What happened about eight years ago is we realized, Edwin Hubble found, that the universe is expanding. How did he find this? In, in Mount Wilson in California, he used the Doppler shift, a known physical effect, in which if you have a source emitting light toward you and the source is receding away from you, the light becoming red, the wavelength of the light become a little bigger, it stretches. So if you have the sun emitting light, you see all these lines telling you about the different elements that emit light from the sun, and the experts know how to, how to read this line and tell you how much carbon, how much oxygen, and so on. But if you look at further and further away objects, you find the same pattern shifted to the right, towards the longer wavelength. And from this shift, one can tell how fast this source is moving away from you. And what is found is the Hubble expansion. Look at this flat universe. And I'm just showing you the part of the infinite universe. This is the expansion, the way everybody is getting away from everybody else. The same thing about here. Think about this sphere as an inflating balloon, and you notice that everybody is getting away from everybody else. And if you ask what is the rule here, you see that the further away the galaxy is from you, the faster it is receding from you. And this is known as the Hubble law. The velocity of a galaxy relative to you is some universal constant called the Hubble constant times the distance to the object. And it's true here, it's true there. And the nice thing about it, it doesn't matter where you sit in the universe. You could sit in any other galaxy, 
And this specific pattern repeats itself and every observer sees the same thing. So it doesn't violate this idea that we are not in, any special, in, in some special place. Any observer on any of these galaxies will see exactly the same Hubble law of expansion. Now, if this was not enough uh, about the prediction from this simple assumption of uniformity, homogeneity, look about this one. Here's time, here's distance, and here's we, here and now. And let's take any object, one galaxy. It's moving away from us. So if we go back in time to find where it was in the past, okay, we just put a straight line backwards. We ignore any forces that would slow it down. And we found that this galaxy, if you move back in time, is approaching us closer and closer and closer as we reach this very specific minute in time. Now take another galaxy, twice as far from us. It is now receding from us with twice the velocity. That's the Hubble law, remember. Now we will go back in time, and we find the very interesting conclusion that this galaxy also, at the very same singular time in the past, was very, very close to us. We can do it for any galaxy, and we get to this notion that we call the Big Bang. We find this fancy name because we know nothing about it. But, and, and it's true in life, you know, the less you know about things, the more fancy names you give them. But uh, I tell you in a second why we don't know. But this, what we do know is that this event, whatever it was, happened about 13.7 billion years ago. We call it giga years. That's the distance from here to there. And what it really means is that all the objects, to some distance in the universe, if we go back in time, are getting closer and closer to us. This means that the density around us of matter is going up and up and up, actually going to infinity as you approach this singular point. Okay? This is the Big Bang. The fact that at some final time in the past, density, temperature, many other properties just blow away. They become completely different from what we know them now, very, very dense, very, very hot, away from our uh, grass. Now, where was this Big Bang? Was it in one point, somewhere here, or here, depending on, on this model, or in many points? Well, the legends say it was in one point, but is this really true? Anybody in the crowd willing to take a vote? Was it in one point? Raise your hand if you think it was in one point. Anybody think it's more than two points? In many, many points? Well, let's see. Let's take this case, okay, and go back in time. Let's shrink the universe in our time machine and see what happens to all the points on this sphere. If I had continued all the way till this balloon is completely empty, all those points would have been one point, right? So there's no any specific point on this sphere in which we can say the Big Bang happened in Jerusalem, in Tel Aviv, in Australia. No, it happened in every point in space which indeed converges to one point, one singular point, as we go back to the Big Bang. But that's not true for this infinite universe. It's infinite at all times, even when you go back in time. So no matter how small you make this little patch, it remains infinite. And you can say that the Big Bang in this infinite universe happened in infinite points, which all were with this infinite density. Okay, so far everything is really homogeneous, and we kept it, and this was a result of the homogeneity. I'm going to show you, well, this is just a demonstration of what we have in mind. In this simulation, you see the three-dimensional expansion, just the galaxies are simply rushing away from each other. That's, that's, that's what it is about. Now, if we needed a confirmation that this is not just a theoretical, mathematical thing, uh, this observation, the same macro background radiation which was discovered, discovered in 1965, tell us that this is probably what happened. Because this radiation, for reasons I will not elaborate on, tell us that this radiation must have been coupled to the atoms, to the matter, very early on just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang. 
This means that every particle of light, a photon, really was scattered and colliding with the atoms of the universe very, very frequently. Unlike what it does today. Today you can send a ray of light through space and it goes straight ahead. Then it was just locally coupled, meaning the universe was much, much denser and hotter uh, much, much earlier. And this is probably the strongest confirmation for this theoretical idea that came from homogeneity alone and, and the basic laws of physics. That the universe indeed was much, much denser, much, much hotter. We can't go all the way back to the Big Bang. We can go not very far from it. Do we understand the Big Bang itself, even with this fancy set of equations? Well, the answer is no, not yet. And that's because this extreme density and temperature require physics that we don't know yet. In particular, we need to combine the theory of quantum mechanics, which rules the microscopic world, with the theory of gravity, general relativity of Einstein, which rules the large scale. The universe was so condensed such that both the effects of quantum mechanics were strong, it was as dense as is inside the atom, and gravity was very strong. And you have to deal with those two things being strong at the same time. We do not have the tools to deal with it. That's, that's why for us the Big Bang is a big mystery. We can tell that we can go back in time all the way there, but what it was exactly? How did it happen? What kind of thing is it that made the universe expand from this singular situation till the present? We know everything that happened after, but not the event itself, or of course, if anything happened before. But now let's go to the future. This we can tell. And we can continue to ask, will this expansion that started at the Big Bang ever stop, maybe recollapse, or continue forever? It turns out that gravity is really exerting attraction between bodies, and the expansion is always slowing down just because you go away, but you are attracted. So you slow down, you decelerate. Will it bring the universe into a halt? Think about this example. I have an instrument here in the gravitational potential of the Earth, and I'm giving it a velocity upwards. This thing probably will go up, stop, and turn around. That's because gravity overwhelmed the kinetic energy I gave the body. But if I'm strong enough, like what you do when you send a rocket to space, you can throw it away such that the kinetic energy is higher than the gravitational potential, and then you escape. It's called the escape velocity. That's how you, you send uh, satellites to space. So the universe may do the same thing, and it's really... Uh, it, it may expand forever, slow down but expand forever, or stop and recollapse to something similar to the Big Bang. We call it the Big Crunch. And it all depends on whether the gravity is strong enough by pulling it in to overcome the motion that was given to the universe at the Big Bang. That's the question. We want to measure how much gravity there is to tell whether the universe is bound or unbound. Well, we look at the telescope. This is some of the biggest telescopes in the world, in Hawaii, in Chile, and so on. And we see galaxies, which are the major uh, objects in the universe, where stars are, about 100 billion stars, like the sun in every galaxy like this. It turns out that if you measure all galaxies that you see in a given volume of space and ask how much mass there is in the luminous matter, in the stars in the galaxy, you find that only, it's only 1% of what's really needed for halting the expansion. You would conclude that the expansion will continue forever. Gravity is just a small perturbation of order 1%. But it turns out that this is just the tip of the iceberg. And this became clear in the previous century, step by step. The real mass in the universe, most of it, 96% of the mass in every volume in space, is really made of some other kind of matter. We call it dark matter. In particular, it's in a halo, an envelope, around every luminous galaxy. How do we know this? Give you an example. We look at the rotation around the galaxy, and instead of seeing the velocity of rotation dropping as you go to larger distances, 
like the planets do around the sun, we find that the velocity of rotation remains constant as far as you can get. We conclude that there is fast rotation more than you expect from this mass that you just see, and the conclusion inevitably is that the strong gravitational force tells you that there is much more mass around this galaxy in the form of this dark mass, dark halo, to be consistent with what we know about the force of gravity. Stand up, please. Another fancy way is gravitational lensing. We look at the cluster of galaxies and we see these blue images of a galaxy far behind this cluster. And we see this very specific pattern of twisted image. It's the same galaxy that you see several times here, the blue. And the way it is distributed around the sky tells you how much mass there is in here, which exert gravitational force that bends the light rays and give you this optical illusion, like it was a huge magnifying glass that makes these images. And this allows us to measure how much mass there is, and we find that the dark matter is about 30 times more than the luminous matter in the universe. Okay? What is this dark matter? Another mystery yet. Okay, we don't know what kind of particle, how to call it by name. It's not the regular atoms, we know that. It's not made of planets, which you will hear about in the next talk. It's not made of black holes that come after stars die. Um, only we have constraints, and I won't elaborate on why we, we, we know it's, it can't be that. It's probably some fancy exotic dark matter particle, which we are going to find in the laboratory sometime in the future. Maybe in this famous uh, LHC experiment in, in CERN, in Geneva, where we're now reaching the highest energies ever. Um, look at this drunk. Neutralinos, photinos, axions, these are real names. All those damn supersymmetric particles you can't see, that is what drove me to drink, but now I can see them. Well, I hope that's not what we are doing in science. We are, we are drinking a little bit, but we have all the reasons to assume that pretty soon, in our generation, they will be discovered in the lab. They have been discovered by gravity, right? We need to identify them by other elementary particle uh, forces. So the conclusion is that the total mass, luminous plus dark, is only 28% of what's needed for the whole universe. It's still not enough to stop the expansion. So here's the third news. Another type of energy is dominated the universe. And I'll tell you how this was discovered. This was discovered about 10 years ago by two groups. The idea was, Let's consider the expansion rate today. This is velocity of galaxies and their distance, and you see this straight line, which is the Hubble law I told you about. This is locally, million light years away. Let's try to use our telescopes to look back in time and found, find how much faster the universe was expanding in the past such that it slowed down to today's rate given by this Hubble constant. So we want to measure the slowdown rate by gravitational attraction. We go to a telescope, and once we, big, we have big telescopes, we realize that looking far is looking back in time, right? That's because the light is moving with a constant velocity, and the, far, the further away the source is, the earlier it emitted the light that we now see. So we can look back in time with a big telescope, we use supernovae, which has huge explosions, making a star becomes billion times brighter. And they allow us to look very far uh, back and tell the distance. And we find this, this was the first data in 1998. And there was a big surprise. We expected that the line would be something tilted like this, telling us the universe was expanding faster in the past slowing down by the expansion, by, by the attraction of gravity. Well, it is just the opposite, as you can see. The universe is rushing away faster and faster and faster in time. Okay? It is accelerating, speeding up, instead of slowing down. Something very strange is happening. It's not the familiar attraction of gravity that we know so well. It's a repulsion by gravity. These are the people 
We're going to get a Nobel Prize for it sometime soon, I'm sure. Uh, so the universe is not really slowing down. It's inflating in an accelerated way. How do we understand this repulsive force that pushes it? You know, that's, that's how you accelerate, if something pushes instead of pulls. Well, we go back to Einstein, and we realize that in Einstein's equation of gravity, there is a term which we use to neglect. It's called the cosmological constant. Mathematically, it's there. As long as it was not needed to explain observations, we didn't really pay attention. Now that we do have this observation, we need this term. It does explain it very well, all within the, the standard theory of general relativity of gravity. Gravity is not only an attractive force. It can play the role of a repulsion. Actually, what it says, what it does at large distances, the self-repulsion of space itself is what drives this acceleration, overcoming any attraction between the masses. It's a property of the vacuum itself. Even if the universe was empty without any matter, the matter is always attracting. This is a repulsion of the universe itself. We call it dark energy, another fancy name because we don't know what it is exactly. We know observationally that 72% of the energy in the universe is this dark energy. So if I have to sum up our universe in this pi diagram or in this list, only 1% is luminous. As you can see, 23% is dark matter and 72% is this dark energy. The universe is going to expand forever. It's not going to recollapse. Is it infinite or not? Well, I'm not going to tell you the details, but the conclusions from measurements of the macro background radiation is the universe is either infinite or very, very big, much bigger than what we can observe. Much, much bigger than 13.7 billion yard light years. In the last part of my talk, I want to discuss the connection between this huge, fantastic, expanding forever universe, and which is bigger than what we can ever observe, bigger than 10 to the 26, power 36 meters. That's the observable universe. That's how long it takes the light to reach us if it was emitted at the Big Bang far away and reaches us today. The universe is much bigger than that, I just told you. And we are creatures of, uh, of the order of one meter. There's 26 orders of magnitude difference between those scales. Still, the universe not only gave birth to life, it kind of conspired to do this in some sense. So this is the history of the Big Bang through fluctuations at the very early time that come from quantum mechanics to this signature of the macro background, this is our grandparents, this little fluctuation. That's what led eventually to the growth of structure, galaxies, stars, planets, and life today along this time sequence. So this is a computer simulation almost extending to the observable size of the universe. You see this cosmic web structure which we see in simulations and in the distribution of galaxies in space. This is how the dark matter has been distributed. The galaxies are these little nodes at the places where the cosmic web filaments touch each other. Let me show you a little simulation of how this cosmic web is being formed. You see only two dimensions. See how the structures grow here, become a big cluster of galaxies, and how these regions become empty because gravity pulls everything into those regions and away from these empty regions. You, what you didn't see in this picture is the expansion of the universe which they took away from the, from the movie. That's how this cosmic web is formed. In our computers, we believe in our universe as well. Another little movie will show you a one patch with the expansion and the collapse locally into what we call a pancake, and then these little galaxies that form here move along this filament and merge by the force of gravity alone to this galaxy at the right center here. So we can study very quantitatively the formation of structure and galaxies and stars and planets. And this is what one of the early galaxies looks like in our simulation. So I just want to mention something very relevant. 
I don't know if he's here, probably not. Professor Donald Lindenbell is going to get uh, honorary doctorate today. Um, this paper that uh, Donald was one of the authors of in 1962 was one of the first papers that really explained how galaxies are formed uh, by gravity, collapse of gravity, a la the movie I just showed you. So galaxies, galaxies are star factories. And I'm going to rush you through how the cosmology gives us life. You start with a galaxy. You look at the center here. It's very cold and dense. And I just zoom in, and you start seeing stars forming. Stars are stars like the sun. Uh, these are regions where those new stars are formed. And in each star, you have a nuclear reactor, a nuclear reaction reactor in which uh, there's um, heavy elements are formed from the initial hydrogen and helium. And in particular, that's where you build the carbon and oxygen, which you will associate with the life we know. The universe without those elements forming the stars would not have given us uh, life the way we know it. You need those stars to generate those elements. Then you need those supernovae, which I already showed you, those explosions, to speed out all those elements, ejecting them into the interstellar space. Now we have gas with a lot of metals. Metals, I mean carbon, oxygen, and the high elements. When you form new stars, like our own sun, you can also form planets, some of them with solid Earth, a surface, on which you can develop life. Some think intelligent life. So uh, the point was that it's a second generation of enriched gas that was able to give us this. Think about this thought. Sometimes I wake up with this thought. We are made from the ashes of that star. Each of us in our body, every molecule, every atom, once at least once, spent its time, millions of years, in the very center of some big star. Okay, think about it, it's a little. Okay, in the last two minutes I have, I'm going to go into speculation, philosophical speculation. So far it was solid science. Uh, and this is the connection to human, uh, namely the, what we call the entropic principle. If you look at the universe, I just gave you very few details, but if you look into details of what's happened, you realize, as a physicist, that there is a fine tuning in the properties of the universe which really required to create life in it. All the constants of nature has to be very specifically tuned to give you life. The age of the universe has to be between 10 to 20 billion years, and so on and so forth. Well, if you are very religious, you would say, it's a grand design. But if you try to address it a little more, uh, still, it's not science. I wouldn't call it science. But in obeying this uniformity and, and, and simplicity issues, uh, you would say the following, that we live in a universe whose properties allow the formation of life. And, and the idea is the following. And here's the speculation. The Big Bang universe, the one I described so far, the one we observed, it's just one of these universes. The universe actually is an infinite space-time, which is homogeneous and looks the same at all time on very large scale. And spontaneously, there are big bangs occurring at random places, creating new mini-universes in this multiverse that we live in. This is much more uniform because in the East, there is no beginning of time. This universe lives from minus infinity to plus infinity. Locally, we have a universe that is more finite. Now, still, to understand all this really happening, we need quantum gravity. It's far from a science theory. It is just for us to play with, with our minds uh, and philosophically to try to get a more uniform thing that we really wanted to look for. It's not where we live scientifically. So let me just summarize. We have this initial fluctuation that we see very early on in the early universe. Then we, the universe generates this cosmic web on large scales. In it, galaxies develop. In those galaxies, stars and planets develop. 
and on one of those planets at least, there is life. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Deckel. Uh, do we have the Riem Sari? Yes. Yeah, you. So you were close to me. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I didn't recognize. Well, sorry. So now le let me introduce Professor Riem Sari. Um, may I have the lights a little bit, please? Professor Riem um, was born in Beersheba. Uh, he is PhD in astrophysics and is professor, obviously, from the Hebrew University. And his thesis, uh, Gamma Ray Burst, is uh, summum cum laude. And he also carries a mathematics and physics degree, uh, both from Ben Gurion University. He's the chair of the Science Museum. Uh, he's also professor in astrophysics and planetary science. He w was awarded during 2009 the Rector Award for outstanding researcher from the Hebrew University and many, many awards back to 1996 where he got his first scholarship. Uh, currently, uh, he got more than 1.5 million euros in grants for he, all his works and uh, he published more than a hundred publications, and he's referred more than 9,000 citations about all his work uh, despite his youth. So, Professor, welcome. Thank you very much. So, good morning, everybody. Um, can we turn off the lights on the, so we can see a little bit better? Thank you. So uh, you can view my talk from two different directions. One is the title that is written here, the formation of uh, the solar system. But the other, which is closely related in the past uh, few years, is that we are now starting a journey to search for life on other places in the universe. So life around other stars, not in our own solar systems, but around some other star. So just to connect with the previous talk, where is Avishai? Disappeared here. Uh, to connect with the, with the previous talk, um, when you go outside, when you go outside tonight, you can look up in the sky, you see many, many points. What are all these points? I believe you all know. These are, most of them, are stars. Other stars, just like our sun, farther away. Some of them are what? Planets in our own solar system. So just a few that orbit our own sun. Some of those stars may have their own planets, but this is the discussion of, uh, of this talk. What about galaxies that Avishai mentioned? There are plenty of them on the sky, but they are very difficult to see. So there's only a couple that you can see with uh, naked eye but they are just on the edge of being able to be seen on the naked eye. So even if you take a small binocular, you can spot quite a few galaxies on the sky. But just like that, in a, with a naked eye, if you go to a good desert, you can see Andromeda. And even that won't be very impressive, you'll see just a smudge. So basically, what we see in the night skies, mostly are stars with a few planets from our own solar system. Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter and Saturn. That's it, basically. So now we are, let me go to the next slide here. Let's go through th some definitions, some of them which I already mentioned. So what are stars? What's the difference between stars, brown dwarfs, planets, and 
more recently, we have a new definition of dwarf planets. So let me go quickly through this so we are oriented. So stars are objects made mostly of hydrogen and helium, which are elements that came from the Big Bang. In the stars, as Avishai mentioned, you produce heavier elements, but the star itself is mostly hydrogen and helium. The, that nuclear fuel, the hydrogen mostly, burns up to heavier and heavier elements. Initially, helium goes, uh, hydrogen goes into helium, and then other elements which are important for the formation of life. And all that happens in stars. For a star to be able to burn its hydrogen into heavier elements, it needs very high densities and very high temperatures in its center. We can do that on Earth. We do that in nuclear bombs. We are trying to make that in a more controlled fashion to solve our energy problems, but stars do that all the time. In order for a star to be able to do that, it needs those high densities and temperatures, and therefore it needs some minimum mass. If you just take a small uh, bunch of uh, hydrogen atoms, you won't get nuclear reactions. What you need is something like 7 or 8 percent of the mass of the sun, and there you have a shining star. If you take anything less than that, what you get is something we call the brown dwarf. It's an object made of the same elements as stars, but just slightly smaller. The densities and temperatures are not high enough, it doesn't have nuclear reactions, and it fades very quickly. So after a, a while, a few million years, it's very hard to, to spot anymore. It becomes dark. Planets are a completely different object. The definition that distinct, distinct planets from brown dwarf and stars is not only their size, though this is a distinction as well, but also the way they form and the role that they play in our uh, universe. So planets, they orbit stars. So they, there is already a star somewhere, either our sun or any other star, and the planet is orbiting around it. The composition is completely different. It is made much more by heavier elements than hydrogen and helium. So it's not made out of the cosmic composition. Somehow you distill the more heavier elements and you take them to form your, your planets. And our, our belief is that planets form from a gas and dust disk that is there around young stars. And I'll show you some evidence for that. What are dwarf planets? So due to more and more discoveries in the recent years, we have many, many objects that we know of that are orbiting our own sun. And the question is, do we want to take every object that is orbiting the sun and call it a planet? Then the planet loses their significance. And we want to keep the planets to what we were used to when we were kids. So, if we just have a pebble that is orbiting around the sun, you don't want to call it a planet. So what's the distinction? The distinction that was uh, chosen a few years ago is that a planet should be something significant. How do, you make, how do you define this significant thing? It has to be large enough so that its own gravity can crush the material from which it is made to make it round. As we know, the Earth is round, and it's not round by a coincidence. This is just because its own gravity squishes it to make it round. So you need the object to be large enough so that the gravity is strong enough to squeeze the material into a round shape. If you just pick a pebble when you go outside here, you hold it, it has some strange shape. This is because its self-gravity is not strong enough to make it round. Another property it needs to have, its gravitation needs to be uh, significant to dominate the environment and therefore to scatter any other small object in its region away from the solar system or to collide with it and absorb it. So basically, each planet, by this definition, is a single thing in its own region. So there are no many small objects in the region of the Earth around the Sun. Why? Because the gravity of the Earth is strong enough to scatter any other thing that would have been in its uh, surrounding. And that's true for any of the planets. Um, this definition, actually, was a bad news for Pluto because Pluto used to be called a planet, but now we know that Pluto is one of a belt. It's called the Kuiper Belt. That Kuiper Belt has, we observed in the Kuiper Belt, already more than a thousand objects, and we know that there are many, many thousands of objects in that belt. And just by the existence of that belt, that demotes Pluto from being a planet, because in our definition, a planet's gravity should have been strong enough to scatter anything in its region. 
the existence of the belt says that it wasn't scattered, and therefore Pluto is not massive enough to be called a planet. Even though it is massive enough to become round, Pluto is round. So Pluto only satisfies half of uh, what is needed for a planet. Okay, so what happened in the last uh, 15 years or so? There was really a big revolution of what we know about planet and how we form, and I'll try to walk you through this uh, if time allows. So we have new knowledge of how planets form from coming from two or three different directions. One is that we see regularly disks around young stars. Okay, and disks are the birthplaces of planets. So we have some ideas of the initial conditions how planets form. What was the conditions when they just formed? Not from our own solar system because our sun is too old and the disk is no longer there. But we can observe other stars which are young, young meaning a few million years old. And there we can uh, see the conditions that are appropriate for planet formation. So it gives us the initial conditions. In a few cases, we can actually observe planets around other stars. We can actually see them. This is this picture in here. Maybe I'll show it uh, later. Uh, but in most cases, we can see just the evidence that planets exist. This is this picture here, which I'll uh, spend some more time uh, later. So we know by now that of at least 400 planets that are orbiting nearby stars. So the examples of planets we know are longer, lo no longer just the eight that we have in our own solar system, but 400 more from other stars. The third direction, so disks, planets around other stars, which tell us uh, different outcomes of planet formation, so our own solar system won't be the only example. And a third direction is exploration of our own solar system, where we discover, for example, the Kuiper Belt. So the Kuiper Belt is a region where planet formation started, but for some reason or another, halted. And therefore, we see a frozen image of how planet formation looked like when the sun was young. So this is really lucky that we have this Kuiper Belt because it's really a laboratory for planet formation that is left for us to study. So th that's the Kuiper Belt, there is also the asteroid belt, there are also other objects that are coming nearby the Earth region and allowing us to study small bodies in our own solar system. Okay, let's start shortly with disks. The left is a real image of a star embedded in a disk. The disk is actually uh, this uh, dark region in here. And we see the light from the star that you cannot see because the disk hides it, scattered from the surface of the disk for us to see. The disk is slowly accreted onto the star, disappears this way. And some of the material of the disk that is coming and accreted onto the star is ejected through jets. We have a few observations like that, but we have some more uh, frequent, indirect evidence that disks exist. We've learned a very important lesson from those disks about planet formation, which we didn't know 20 years ago. And this is the time scale for planet formation. So if you look on this figure, so this is a, a graph, here's the age of a star, okay? So six, Six here means uh, 10 to the six years, a million years. This is 10 million years, and this is 100 million years. That's the age of the star. And the y-axis here is how many of those stars that have that age have actually disks around them. So we see that when the star is young, less than a million years old, somewhere here, the fraction of disks is huge, almost one. That means that most stars have disks disks around them when they are born. However, if you wait that the star will be slightly older, let's say 20 million years, almost none of the stars have disks around them. So if you want to form planets, you have to do it fast. How fast? Within 10 to 20 million years. Okay, that's the allowed time for planet formation. We don't know that from our own solar system, but we know that from the lifetime of disks around other stars. Before these observations, we couldn't tell if the planets in our own solar system formed within a million years, 10 million years, 100 million years, or even 5 billion years, because our sun is 5 billion years old. So we had 5 billion years to form planets. But we know that the disks out of which the planets form only exist in the first 10 million years or so. So we have to form the planets fast, and that's new. 
Okay, in a few cases I already mentioned, you can have direct detection of planets. Detection of planets is really exciting because we can hope to find life on these planets, and I'll get to that a little bit later. But it turns out it's really hard to really observe the planet. The reason is that a planet, by definition, is orbiting a star, and the star is much brighter than the planet. We only see the planet because the star shines on the planet, and the small reflection from the planet is what we're able to see. This is how we see the planets in our own solar system. But in our own solar system, we're close to the sun, and we can look on the planets when they're on the other side from the sun. So we're not blinded by the huge luminosity that is coming from the sun. If you try to do that around any other star, the star and the planet are very close to each other, and it's really hard to separate them. And this is why observations like these, like these are very rare. We only have a couple of examples. Instead, we are measuring the existence of those planets in indirect methods, meaning without looking at the planet itself, we have some idea that the planet is there. And let me walk you through uh, two of these methods. One is called the radial velocity. This is the main method by which about 400 planets were detected. And one is a rising um, method called transits, which is now as good as the radial velocity one. And I believe it, in the coming few years, it will overtake the radial velocity method. So it will be up to date in the current technique for detecting planets. And both, I think, are simple to explain. So here is actually a star. This big object is a star. And this is a planet. The planet is orbiting the star. And as a result, of course, the star pulls the planet gravitationally. But the planet also pulls the star. And therefore, the star is also orbiting. Much, uh, a much smaller motion than the planet, but also a significant one. Usually these planets, let's say Jupiter versus the Sun, the planet is a thousand times lighter than our Sun. Therefore, the motion of the Sun, due to the orbit of a planet like Jupiter, will be a thousand times smaller than the motion of the planet itself. Planets in our own solar system move around the Sun with velocities of something like 30 kilometers per second. This is the velocity of the Earth around the Sun, 30 kilometers per second. And therefore, the reflex motion of the Sun, due to the same planet orbiting it, is a thousand times smaller. So instead of 30 kilometers per second, 30 meters per second. 30 meters per second, that's a measurable velocity. So you can go by, by the technique of uh, Doppler. So you can go and measure the velocity of the star and therefore deduce that the planet around it exists. Let me show you a few uh, figures like that. Here is a velocity that was, me was measured, the velocity of a given star. Here's the velocity in meters per second. And this is the uh, time, basically. So you see that the velocity of the star changes, goes up and down as the planet is orbiting it. The planet pulls the star and shakes the star, and we measure that velocity. So we observe only the star. But since the velocity of the star as a function of time is changing, Periodically, we deduce that the planet is orbiting it. You can see here that the velocity is higher than what I suggested it would be. I suggested the velocity of something like 30 meters per second, but you can read off here that it's hundreds of meters per second. Why do you think is that? So these velocities are higher than what we can expect from knowing our own solar system. Yeah, the planets are not the planets that we have in our own solar system. They are different. They're, they can be different in two ways. They could be more massive, therefore shake the sun more vigorously, or they can be closer to the sun. And we can know about those two properties separately because we can see the orbital period. How long does it take the velocity of the star to change? And we can see how much it is changing. And from that, we can, we can tell both about the mass and the orbital period of those planets. Okay, in our solar system, well, the, the, the solution of Newton's equation is an elliptical motion. Circular being a special case of elliptical motion. In our solar system, the motion is, of course, elliptical, but very close to being circular. The deviation uh, are measured by a few percent, from being a perfect circle to a slightly deformed ellipse. In the system that we see around other stars, we see many more elliptical orbits than we have in our own solar system, and this is one of the riddles we're trying to, to solve. How does it happen, and why is our solar system different? You can see actually in this figure here, this is a star 
for which there are uh, many planets orbiting it, all around the same star, so it's a, really a solar system. And you can see that the orbits, while this orbit is roughly circular, meaning the sun is more or less at the center, this one is more of an elliptical orbit that the sun is not at the center of this ellipse. So this one is actually quite an elliptical orbit that is more circular, and then there is an inner one very close to the star that causes these huge velocity changes, but this one has a circular orbit. So there's a big story about circular versus eccentric, and that's a big uh, channel of research. Uh, the record holder for now is the system that holds five planets around the same star. So almost like our own solar system. If you inspect the, the planets, so here is, here is our own solar system, and here is this other star, nearby star, that has five planets. Some of the planets have orbits similar to Jupiter, though the planets themselves are a little bit more massive. And surprisingly, this system has many more planets which are very close to the star, much closer than anything we have in our own solar system. What we believe about those very close planets is that they formed far away from the star, just like in our own solar system, and then migrated in. We don't have any mechanism that we know of that, could, that can form planets so close to the star. So we believe that the planets formed away from the sun, and due to interaction between the planet and the disk, they migrated inward and got very close uh, to their stars. By the way, I also, I also believe that this is what caused the system to become more eccentric. The fact that they migrated somehow increased their eccentricity. Yeah, the the, uh, the yes, so the time scale for planet migration is a few million years, and we know that the disk lives for a few million years. So therefore, it's really possible that in many systems, the planets, some of the planets went all the way and sunk into their stars. And what we see is the few survivors. So it could have been that there were many more planets around those stars, and they migrated in, and we lost them, yes. So some stars that we do see are standing so close to the sun that it will be surprising why they didn't go all the way through. So we think some of them just went all the way. Okay, this is the next method. A very uh, simple method to realize. It uh, takes a little bit of luck, but if you have that luck, it's, uh, it's an easy method. So what is it? Suppose that there is the sun. Let's make uh, the microphone being the star. And let's have a planet being this. And the planet is orbiting the, the sun in a plane, but you, the observer, just happen to be in the same plane. So when the planet is here, it hides the sun from you, just a little bit. Since the planet is smaller than the sun, only a small fraction of the light of the sun will be missing. So you'll see an occultation, you'll see what we call a transit, and you'll see a small dimming of the light coming from the, from the star. Since the radius of the sun is about 10 times the radius of Jupiter, or hopefully similar planets around other stars, the area of the sun is 100 times larger than the area of Jupiter. So when Jupiter goes in front of a sun like that, it hides about 1% of the light. So here is, a, here is an example here. You measure the light from the star as a function of time. It's more or less constant. And all of a sudden, for three hours, it becomes dimmer by, if you read from this axis, about 1%. Slightly more in this example because the planet is slightly bigger than Jupiter. And then after three hours, the planet goes away and you see back the full star. So if you detect an object, uh, a star that does this trick, you think that a planet uh, passed in front of it and you can wait until the planet will come again and verify if your prediction is true. If you see that happening periodically, you're sure that the planet is there. In this method, we can uh, actually find very small planets. Let's see what's the limiting, uh, limiting problem in here. As you see this figure, the first one is very noisy, while this one is very, very accurate. These are actually the same system, this one and this one. This is just not as well measured, and this is perfectly measured. What's the difference? Can someone guess? You know, when you go outside to the night sky, some of the stars, they flicker, right? Twinkle, twinkle, little star. Why do they do that? It's our atmosphere. So our atmosphere is the one that is making all this noise here. 
and making it difficult to detect this small decrease, this 1% decrease in the light from the star. So if we want to make a more accurate measurement, what should we do? Just go outside of the atmosphere. Cost a little bit of money, but other than that, it's not a problem at all. So you go, you pay a few billion dollars, you put your uh, telescope in space, beyond the atmosphere, nothing shakes now, and you can see a perfect, uh, nice light curve of the same object in here. Doing it this way, you can even detect uh, planets as small as the Earth orbiting that star. And this is our hope that we can detect Earth-like planets pretty soon uh, around other stars. Okay. This is actually, uh, where's the sound? No sound? Four, three. This is the launch two. Engine start. of a satellite One, that is zero about to do exactly that. Off of the Delta II rocket with Kepler on a search for planets in some way like our own. Just over a year ago, and it's going to find many, many uh, dips like that. It already started giving us some information. It works as predicted. And this should be able to good. find objects as small as the Earth orbiting around other stars. T minus 10, 9, 8, 7. There is yet uh, another method that is related to what Avishai talked about, about lensing. Avishai showed you a galaxy or a cluster of galaxy that has so much mass in, this, in it that it can bend the light from background galaxies and therefore you can see them multiple times. The same thing actually can happen with uh, planets and stars. So here's a system in which a planet uh, is multiply lensed and therefore the light that you see from, that, uh, from some background object is increased dramatically and you can infer from that situation, I won't get to the details, that a planet was actually there. Okay, so let's go quickly over the finding and surprises that came uh, from our new knowledge on uh, planets around other stars. So first, we detected many planets, more than 400. They were more massive than we expected, more massive than Jupiter, maybe 10 times more massive, some of them. Those are the easiest to detect, so that's why it could have been expected that the first one we will detect will be the more massive ones. So they're more massive than uh, Jupiter, and they have short orbital periods, or many of them have short orbital periods, we believe because they migrated. This is again a selection effect. It's easier to detect the ones that are close to the stars because then they shake the star more vigorously, and they also have more probability to hide uh, the star in a transit behind them. So these are the first one we'll see, and we believe we'll see more of other kinds later on. They have eccentric orbits, which is the question that uh, came in here, rather than circular orbits that we have in our solar system. Some of them have strange densities, uh, so that may be able to teach us some physics, actually, about how um, gas, like hydrogen, when it's so highly compressed in the center of a planet, is behaving. One of the good surprises that we had is that planets are extremely frequent. About 10% of the stars that we actually looked at have planets around them. And you know, we have many, many stars just in our own galaxy. And if 10% of them have planets, some planets are obviously going to look like the Earth and maybe have life on it. So we'll get to that in the next slide, maybe. Um, let's skip the last star. Okay, so where do we want to look for life? I think this question is actually uh, too complicated for us to answer at this stage. But we're doing the best we can, and the best we can is to look what we have here. We know that life exists on the Earth, and therefore, if we find planets which have similar properties to the Earth, probably or likely or maybe, life will exist in there too. Okay? So, what do you want to do? You want to find planets which have solid surfaces, because if, you, if we'll go to a planet like Jupiter, we'll sink all the way to the center because Jupiter is a gaseous planet. We want to have some solid surface to stand on, and uh, planets with solid surfaces are small. If you, if you just learn from our own solar system, the small planets, Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, they are solid, they are small. The gas giant, Jupiter and Saturn, are huge, but they are gaseous, no solid surface. So we don't want these 
easy to find large planets. We want to find the small ones. That's why we send this mission Kepler to be able to find the smallest planets that will have solid surfaces that can sustain life. Second thing, we want to have the right temperatures. Okay, what are the right temperatures? Everybody know, knows here, right? If you go outside, that's not the right temperature. You want to be inside with the air condition on. So humans are really sensitive. They want the temperature not too cold, not too hot. You go to the shower, your wife wants it a little bit hotter, you want it a little bit colder. We're really sensitive to, to the range of temperatures we can uh, bear. Um, so therefore, it's a matter of uh, distance from the star. You don't want to be too close to the star. You don't want to be too far from the star so it won't be too cold. It also depends which star you're orbiting. If the star is luminous, you can be far away from it because the star is so luminous it can heat up a planet that is even far away from it. If the star is small, therefore very subluminous compared to our sun, you want to be closer to it to have the right temperatures. So we allow here some freedom. We don't need exactly 27 degrees Celsius or something, but we at least want water to be in a liquid state. Why? Just because this is what we know about life from Earth. Now here I want to put a word of caution because even on Earth, we can see a big deviation from that. We know this is a picture from Yellowstone. I think this is a, um, a walkway around uh, this small lake here that is boiling. And all the colors that you see here are actually all kind of bacteria that are flourishing in temperatures which are 100 degrees. So it's probably not necessary to even have this narrow range of temperatures, but this is the best we know. Why? Because our biology is not advanced enough so you can't go to a biologist and tell him, what is it that I need so you can guarantee that life will emerge? We don't have the answer for that. But we do have this single example here that life emerged when liquid water existed, and therefore we go for that. This allows us for this band. What is this band? This is the distance from the star, and this is how massive and therefore how luminous the star is. So if you're around a massive star, you can look far away. If you're near... Uh, Low mass star, you should be close in. So the yellow band is so-called the habitable zone, the zone where you will find liquid water. Most of the planets we have found so far are close, very close to the star, so they are located mostly here, not in the habitable zone, habitable zone, except of maybe one or two systems that are just touching the habitable zone and therefore more likely to have uh, life on them. So. In the next few years, we may find some uh, more suitable planets. Let me maybe finish then with this uh, slide. Uh, what do I have here? I have an image from the movie Contact, where Judy Foster is uh, sitting at the VLA and looking for signals from nearby intelligence. This is the largest radio telescope that we have on Earth. Uh, it is the Arecibo uh, telescope. The diameter here is 300 meters. So it can absorb even the weakest signal, or it can also transmit very accurately to space. And the question is, suppose we have found a suitable planet. Can we talk with those guys? Can we do anything useful with them? What are we going to do with life about uh, around other stars? So uh, it turns out that with current technologies, assuming that those guys have the same thing, not more advanced, not less advanced, just the same thing as we do, we can just barely transmit to them something significant. What is something significant? How would you define a significant uh, information? Hmm? Yeah, radio signal, but what would you put on this radio signal? If you uh, say hello, is that significant? They probably speak a different language. Pi, pi, yeah, digits of pi. So um, here, uh, we looked on something slightly different, maybe a little bit too much information, but we can transmit over a year time, over these distances, the information we have in our DNA. That is significant inf information, right? So we can tell them who we are. We'll just say the uh, building blocks of the DNA, and then if they are intelligent enough, they can compose it, understand it, and actually uh, find out how we look. Maybe it's too much information because it tells them exactly how to deal with us. So maybe we want to get their DNA first before we give uh, our DNA, but at least the idea here that it's possible. 
we can communicate them in a, with them in a sensible manner. The only problem is that the signal will take about 100 years <laughs> to get there and 100 years uh, to get it back. That's the distances we're talking about, even for these closest systems. So I'll finish here, and thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Sari, and uh, I invite Professor Deckel as well. So we have time for these two professors of 10 minutes questions. If there is any question, we have Mike, so you, we can assist to raise that questions. Jan, please. But wait, wait, wait a second, please. You will have the mic. Your, your presentation was very impressive and nice, but it seemed there was a lot of speculation in it because, as you said, we only know about 1% of what the universe contains. And uh, there were a lot of assumptions, for example, like the theory of gravity really holds. I mean, if, if we don't find that missing matter, the dark matter, then maybe we have to make major revisions even in the fundamental picture of what gravity is and so forth. So maybe you could comment a bit on that. The amount of speculation contained yeah, in your no, I presentation. Would, can I, have a, I wouldn't call it speculation. Uh, in both talks, you heard about things we know and things we don't know. Now, let me focus on the dark matter, okay? We know that there's something there that exerts gravitational attractions on other bodies and on light. We measure that. So by gravity, we have detected something. We give it a name, dark matter. What we don't know is how this dark matter interacts with other particles through other interactions. In particular, there's one which we call the weak interaction, which we hope to detect this particle also through it. We don't have a hope to detect it through electromagnetic forces, which are the main forces that we know and love in our daily life, because it's dark matter. It does not interact through the electromagnetic force. That's why it doesn't emit light. So we find this thing which doesn't emit light. Look, this Earth doesn't emit light. You're not surprised because you were born on it and you, why not having more of it there? Now, how can you get away without dark matter? You have to change the laws of physics that we have developed through the years with all the phenomena we know. You can do it, but then you're going to violate the principle of simplicity, sometimes called the Occam razor idea. And that's the only way we can do science, by making the simplest possible assumptions. In this case, in my case, it was symmetry, homogeneity, no special place, and adopt the physics that you have developed so far to explain how planets move around the sun, how the sun moves around the sun, things we know and understand, how to build bridges on Earth, and so on, in engineering. And then you find a new phenomenon, which is telling us that Objects move too fast. Can we explain it with the, with the laws we know? Yes, we just need matter which doesn't shine electromagnetically. If we will find sometimes an evidence against the existence of dark matter, which we haven't found so far, we may need to pay a bigger price, namely change the laws of nature that we know. But we're not going to do it every time that something new is discovered. No. There are many observers around, we learn every day something new. If we had changed the rules of the game, the laws of nature that we know uh, for every new phenomena, we will not get anywhere. The whole idea of science is to have minimum number of assumptions, minimum number of rules and laws of nature to explain the whole rich variety. So I think we are on the right track. And uh, the test will be, I hope, that in the next few years, the experiments which are now running and being run and being developed will allow us to detect the dark matter particle by the weak interaction. Being weak, it's very hard. Those particles go through the earth without even noticing it, and one in every many billions is going to hit our big experiment and, and tell us that it exists. So it will take time. We have to be patient. But the logic of the scientific method is leading us. Keep the rules that you have, namely Einstein and Newton's 
theories of gravity, and with them try to explain everything. So at this point, it's pretty clear there must be dark matter there. If we knew everything about it, we weren't standing here, you know, many of us are being paid salaries from universities and research to try to learn more and more. And it's good that we have this open question. Sorry for the long answer. So we will take one more question to Professor Sari, if you want, please. Yep, get a mic. My, my, my question was going to be pro to Professor Deckel, but um, uh, I can my questions too. Oh, okay, <laughs> okay, I'll, okay. I'll, I'll, I'll ask to, um, to Professor Sari. You were saying that 10% uh, of planets, 10% um, of, of stars um, have, have planets. Exactly. Could, it, could it be that because we haven't detected the smaller planets yet, that a far higher proportion have planets? Absolutely. So if you look on the slide, it had a bigger than 10%, I think, yeah. You see, more than 10% just because of what you just said. So 10% we know have planets. The fact that we haven't detected around the other 90% doesn't mean they don't exist. It could be that they are smaller or farther away from the sun. So Earth-like planets could have been hiding on all these uh, planets that we searched for and we haven't detected them, okay? We, de we only search for about the few maybe 4,000 stars which are close to us. And we detect the 10%, that's where the 400 is coming. But the rest of the 4,000 could still have planets. They are just smaller and farther away from the, from the star. So it's related to the other question. This is what we know, and you can speculate about the other 90%. Um, may I suggest an applause for the two professors? We will enjoy uh, 10 minutes breaks, and please uh, come in 10 minutes, please. Hello. Well, welcome to the second part of this session. Uh, one of the aspects that triggers the two presentations that we have heard is uh, how many metaphors triggers these science-based presentations. In uh, talking about metaphors, uh, the second part uh, will be other part of looking of this Genesis and Big Bang. So let me introduce uh, the two professors that will take care of this second part. Uh, first, in the order of their presentation, Professor Said Sakovic. He is the professor that carries the Bible studies, what they call the Cathedra of Father Takehi Otsuki. And let me show the general research interest of Professor Sakovic, literal critical commentary on the scroll of Ruth, uh, commentary on the scroll of Song of Songs, the idea of Exodus, inner biblical interpretation, the book of Genesis in the old versions and ancient Jewish literature. Born in Haifa in a PhD at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, uh, lecturer, senior lecturer, associate professor, uh, and other appointments as visiting lecturer at the University of Pennsylvania, even visiting professor at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, profess is professor since 1994, and his extended and selected publication, some of this I want to mention because trigger my attention, in 2008, Professor Sakovic wrote The Exodus and the Big Bang. In two years in advance, anticipation of this type of session. Other one is a strange biography on Sanson and many, many others that uh, I don't have time, but probably you will enjoy the 30 minute presentation of Professor Sakovic. So, Professor, thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. I was very happy to hear Avishai Dekel saying that we don't know yet what the Big Bang was like. And since we don't know what it was like, let's turn to the big book, to the Bible. It's Sunday morning, the first day of creation. The light has just been created. So we have some time to discuss the matter of creation in the Bible and the relationship between creation and history. As you very well know, the Bible was not created in a cultural vacuum. Israel was always an integral part of the surrounding cultural world. We have adapted some of the traditions of the ancient Near East, others we have rejected, and still many more we polemicized or we struggled with. You know that there was a variety, a big variety of uh, creation traditions in the ancient Near East. Two of them you see in the shop window of the Bible at the very beginning of the book of Genesis in chapters one and two, but we will mention some others too. The question of questions that I'm going to deal with this morning is why do we open or start our national history with the story of creation? Can you imagine, let's say, a history of the United States starting with the creation of the world, of the UK? No, of course not. So, and what is the relationship between the creation and history or between history and creation? As you very well know, every revolution needs a manifesto. The communist revolution had its own manifesto, and Le Havdil, the monotheistic revolution, needs a manifesto too, and the Bible is the manifesto of the monotheistic revolution. And for this revolution, it's very in important to emphasize that our God of history is one, and he is the one who created the world. One God, not many gods, was involved in the process of creation. And that's why we all have to respect him, to revere him, to fear him, etc. All, all, all forces of creation, all forces of nature, including the sea, the strongest of all forces, uh, revere God, and that's why we all have to revere him too. As you see in text number one on the handouts, I hope that you all have the handouts, Jeremiah 5.22, should you not revere me, says the Lord, should, should you not tremble before me, who set the sand as a boundary to the sea, as a limit for all time not to be transgressed, though it waves toss, they cannot prevail. Though they roar, they cannot pass it. As we'll see later on, uh, there were traditions in the ancient Near East known also to the writers of the Bible that actually the sea or the ocean uh, represents a deity that, that fought against God in the process of creation. So here we are being told that the sea has no power actually to fight our God. On this handout, I did not quote the most famous tradition of creation, the one you meet actually when you read Genesis 1. But try to imagine this story. It's a story about creation ex materia, not a creation ex nihilo. And let's imagine we are, we are sitting in an empty hall of a theater and we look at the stage. And the stage carpenter gets on the stage. The first thing he has to do is to turn on the light. And then what he finds is actually chaos because there are some objects there left from previous shows and he has to organize the stage, you know, to, to separate light from darkness, to separate what, the waters from the sky, to separate the earth from the sea. And then, of course, he starts building the design he adds the fauna and the flora, and then at the end, it's time for the actors, for the humans to get on the stage and to start, to start the real play, the play of history, the play of human history. And, um, but thinking again about this uh, six-day or seven-day unit uh, creation, 
uh, we have to remember that this seven um, day unit is well divided into pairs. At least the first six days are divided into pairs. The first, in the first day, light was created. In the fourth day, the luminaries were put out in heaven. In the second day, the waters and wa the, the sea was divided from the sky. In the fifth day, all the creatures that live in the water and in the sky are created. The third day is the day when the earth was created. And then in the sixth day, all the creatures that live on the earth were, were created. And of course, on Shabbat, God has to rest. They, it's very interesting that uh, also in the ancient Near East, um, in Babylonia and also in Canaan, we have also traditions about a seven-day unit. But there the pairs are divided differently. And you have it on te in text number two, uh, an example from the Gilgamesh epic, when the ship or the boat is rests at the end of the, uh, of the flood tradition on the top of the mountain, Mount Nisir. On Mount Nisir, the ship came to a halt. Mount Nisir held the ship fast, allowing no motion. One day, a second day, Mount Nisir held the ship fast, allowing, allowing no motion. A third day, a fourth day, again, again. A fifth day, a sixth day. When the seventh day arrived, I sent forth and set free a dove. Okay, but now let's, let's move on to uh, the time that man takes the main role in the, in the play of history. And um, we know that for history, we need order, we need the laws of nature, we need time. Uh, creation brings with it the laws of nature and brings with it the routine, which is actually the biggest miracle of all. Uh, I bring here a uh, quote here, a text from rabbinic literature from Midrash Sifra, uh, how manifold are thy works, O Lord, etc. That's from uh, Psalm uh, 104. Thou hast creatures that live in the sea and that live on the land. If those that live in the sea go on to the land, they die. And if those that live on the dry land go into the sea, they die. There are creatures that live in fire and creatures that live in the air. If those that live in fire go into the air, they die, etc., etc. You got the message. Anyway, since creation, creation and creating the world, its routine, it's the biggest of all miracles, then all other miracles that took place later in history are actually just like minor brush strokes that the painter here uh, adds here and there to his painting. And that's why we don't really have a term for miracle in the Hebrew Bible. The word nest that we use is actually a, a later creation. Sometimes in the Bible, we use the term creation for a miracle. If you look at uh, text number six from the book of Numbers, about the story of Korah and his gang. You, you remember when they are being swallowed uh, by the earth. But if the Lord creates a creation so that the ground opens its mouth and swallow them up with all that belongs to them and they go down alive in Sheol, into the underworld. So the term which is being used is Briah, in Briah Yivra Adonai. And uh, the idea of miracle actually doesn't go very well with creation because what do we need miracles if the world is, has already been created and creation is perfect? And that's why what the rabbis are doing in the Mishnah, in text number seven, they tell you that all the miracles that took place later in history were already into the, uh, co the program of the computer uh, since before the process of creation ended. Uh, look at the text. Ten things were created on the eve of Shabbat between the suns at nightfall. The mouth of the earth that swallowed Korach and his guys. The mouth of the well that followed the Israelites while they were wandering in the, in the wilderness. The mouth of the Shias that spoke to the prophet Balaam. Etc., etc. 
creation in the Bible is actually an integral part of history. The first story of creation, the one of chapter 1, actually ends in chapter, at chapter 2, verse 4. Such is the record of the story, such is the record of heaven and earth when they were created. And this terminology or this formula is repeated again and again and again in the book of Genesis. Eile toldot, such is the record of Adam and Eve, or later such is the record of the lines of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, to show you that the, that the creation of the world was just the very beginning of history and still an integral part of it. And if we look into later chapters of the Bible, we'll see how creation affects also these stories. For instance, text number nine. When we enter the country with Joshua, which is the beginning of the second part of the Bible, of the Nevi'im, of the prophetic books, we have the story of the conquest of Jericho, the first city in the land of Canaan to be conquered by the Israelites. And if you look at this story, you see that it, it is an inverse of the story of creation in Genesis 1. In Genesis 1, all creatures were actually created uh, within six days, and nothing happened on the seventh day, meaning God rested on the seventh day. In the story of the conquest of Jericho, it's all reversed because nothing really happened on the first six days when the people of Israel surrounded the city again, again, again. On the seventh day, everything happened, meaning the, the city was conquered, the, the walls of Jericho collapsed. In, in the book of Genesis, in the creation story, all creatures were created in the six days. In the story of Jericho, actually all creatures, every living creature in Jericho was uh, exterminated in the seventh day. While the story of creation ends with a blessing, God blesses the Shabbat, the seventh day. In the story of Joshua, at the very end of this quotation, verse 26, at that, at that time Joshua pronounced this oath. Cursed of the Lord be the man who shall undertake to fortify the city of Jericho, etc., etc. You see, even when we want to talk about the, the opposite of, of creation, about destruction, we still go back to the very first story in the Bible, to the story of creation. But talking about relationship between creation and history, we must pay special attention to the story of the Exodus. Uh, well, there is an e equation actually in the, in the Bible. There are two ma major events in history. One of them is creation and the other one is the Exodus. One is the creation of the world and the other is the creation of the Jewish people, which actually starts with the Exodus. And when I speak about an equation, you can see, look at text number 10. In text number 10, we have, of course, the, a quotation from the Ten Commandments, the commandment of the Shabbat. And if you ask yourselves, why do you have to observe the Shabbat? The answer is uh, three lines from the end of the quotation. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth and sea and all that in them, and he rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Shabbat day and hallowed it. If you look at the second edition of the Ten Commandments, which we find in Deuteronomy chapter 5, you know since the Ten Commandments were given, us, were given to us for free, we, got actually, we asked for two uh, editions. So if you look at the second edition, again the, th the third line from the end of the quotation, remember that you were a slave in the land of Egypt, and the Lord your God freed you from there, with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. Therefore, the Lord your God has commanded you to observe the Sabbath day. So you see, in one edition, it's because of the creation. In the other edition, it's because of the exodus from Egypt. Again, the relationship between these two events becomes clear in a quotation that I bring here from Psalm 136, which is number 12 on your handout. 
At this psalm, we glorify God for his great deeds, for his wonders. And it starts with, who made the heavens with wisdom? His steadfast love is eternal. Who spread the earth over the water? I don't repeat the line, his steadfast love is eternal. But it's always there. Who made the great light, the sun to dominate the day, the moon and the stars to dominate the, the night? And immediately, from the fourth day of creation, I immediately move on, or the text moves on, to the Exodus. Who struck Egypt the, through their firstborn and brought Israel out of their midst with a strong hand and outstretched arm. There is nothing important in between, between the creation and the Exodus. And you see it again and again in the Bible, how these two events are related to one another. Look at text number 13. It's from Deutsch Isaiah. Uh, well, this prophet didn't know that we will refer to him as Deutsch Isaiah. You know that in the book of Isaiah from chapter 40 on, we have a different a prophet who lives in the time of redemption, in the time of the return to Zion, and he is very excited about the times he is living through. And he uh, listened to his voice, awake, awake, clothe yourself with splendor, O arm of the Lord. Awake as in the days of old, as in former ages. It was you that hacked Rahab in pieces that pierced the dragon. What am I talking about? What is a prophet talking about, actually? What, 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 what dragon are we talking about? What Rahab, and that's Rahab that you mentioned in the, the, the new uh, planet that we have now in heaven, Rahab. What, what, Rahab, what is it? Uh, well, this reflects a different kind of tradition about the creation of the world very similar to the tradition of the creation we know from the ancient Near East about the head of the pantheon fighting all these sea monsters, uh, including one of them uh, whom he actually kills and from the body of which he creates the world. And that's what the prophet is referring to, uh, to talking about, you know, hack hacking Rahab in pieces or piercing the dragon. By the way, the dragon in Hebrew is Tanin, Tanin and Rahab, and these were the two first submarines of the Israeli Navy, which we were very proud of to have. The first two submarines after 2,000 years, as if we had submarines before 2,000 years, but anyway. So we are talking about the creation of the world, but look, look at verse number 10. What am I talking about reading t uh, verse number 10 now? It was you that dried up the sea, the waters of the great deep, that made the abysses of the sea a road the redeemed might walk. What event are we talking about here? Hello? About the Exodus, exactly. So you see, <laughs> again, we move directly from the creation of the world to the Exodus. So let, and now we continue. So let the ransom, uh, ransomed of the Lord return and come with shouting to Zion, crowned with joy everlasting. Let them attain joy and gladness while sorrow ends and sighing flee. You see that we are talking now about the future, about the coming redemption. So what happened in creation repeated itself in the Exodus and will repeat itself in the approaching redemption. But why, why do we have this resemblance between the two? Because if we think about the creation, not the way we have it in Genesis chapter 1, but the way we have it in the ancient Near East, meaning the head of the pantheon fighting the sea monster, creating from its body the world, then you see the resemblance to the Exodus. Because what do we have, uh, what story do we have in the Exodus? that the sea, the sea of reeds is being dried so the Israelites can pass through. So God is not fighting the monsters in the creation time, but is fighting Israel's enemies, letting them pass through the sea, and they, the enemies, drown into in the sea. That's how, you know, the, the myth is actually historicized, 
and makes it uh, or moves from the ancient times into history, into the story of the Exodus. I brought you just one example, a very famous example uh, of this ancient New Eastern uh, tradition from the Enuma Elish, which is the creation epic, the Babylonian creation epic. I won't read the whole thing. You can read it tonight if you have time. But it's, I'll read the beginning and the end. While the gods of battle sharpened their weapons, then joined issue Tiamat. Tiamat is what we have in Hebrew, Tehom, the deep waters. Tehom, which is mentioned in the first verse of the book of Genesis. Tiamat and Marduk. Marduk is the chief god, uh, wisest of gods. They strove in single combat, locked in battle. I move on. He released, he, meaning Marduk, released the arrow, it tore her belly, it cut through her inside, splitting the heart. Having thus subdued her, he extinguished her life. He cast down her carcass to stand upon it. After he had slain Tiamat, the leader, her band was shattered, her troop broken up. And then he takes, he takes her body, he split her like a shellfish into two parts. Half of her he set up and sealed as it as sky. So now you understand how the world was created. Very different from what we heard from the physicists earlier. But I'm sure that the Babylonian uh, tradition is uh, uh, tr actually very true. Yeah. Anyway, it's not just the Babylonian tradition because we know it also from ancient Canaan. You know that the only, only Can Canaanite library we have is from the city of Ugarit, which was actually uh, excavated in the uh, 1930s, and a large archive was found there. Many of the uh, texts there are pretty boring, commercial texts and legal texts, but still we have their epic texts which are so very interesting, epic poetry, which is so very similar to biblical poetry. And here I quote just one line. Baal, again, Baal is the chief god of Canaan. Baal would rend, would smash Yam. Yam is the sea, the ocean. Would annihilate Judge Nahar, Judge the river. Again, you see the, the war the Teomachia, the war between gods. One god, Baal, is killing these two monsters, Yam, the ocean or the sea, and Nahal, the river. Now you really see the relationship to the Exodus story. Because thinking about the Exodus story, how does it start? With us, uh, uh, actually, or with, with God and Moses, splitting the waters of the sea so we can pass to the Sea of Reeds. And how does it end? With Joshua splitting the waters of the river, of the Jordan River, so we can go get into the land of Canaan. So you see how the myth is actually being moved into history. And, and this tradition about Yam and Nahal, a sea and river, is well known to our prophets. Just one quotation from the book of Nahum. I'm sure that you haven't read Nahum lately. That's why I decided to mention Nahum here. Text number 13, uh, 16. He rebukes the sea and dries it up, and he makes all rivers fail, Bashan and Carmel, etc., etc. Now, we see that the prophets know very well this tradition about God fighting the sea monsters in the creation uh, process. It's so interesting that this tradition was actually ignored by the writers of the book of Genesis. They didn't want to um, give any clue to this tradition because it didn't agree with their concept of, you know, having only one God, having no other divine creatures. But it's very difficult or it's even impossible to kill a good story. So this tradition, not written in the Bible, not written in the book of Genesis, was still very well known 
to our prophets who mention it, who refer to it. And if it was known to our prophets who refer to it, you can be certain that it was also very well known by all the, the people that listened to the prophets. They knew this type of creation tradition. So for instance, we have here a quotation from the book of Isaiah chapter 27, talking about the future, about the days to come, where again, when God will save the people of Israel, in that day, the Lord will punish with his great, cruel, mighty sword, Leviathan, the elusive serpent, Leviathan, the twisting serpent. He, he will slay the dragon of the sea. Again, in Psalm, 40, uh, in Psalm 74, which is text 19 on your handout, uh, the Judahites, the people of Judah, who are so frustrated, who, so, who suffer so much in the present, hope that God will repeat his great deeds in the day of creation. It was you who drove back the sea with your might, who smashed the heads of the monsters in the waters. It was you that crushed the heads of Leviathan, who left him as food for the denizens of the desert. I have three minutes now, and in three minutes, I would like to refer to the second story of creation that we have in the shop window in the book of Genesis. The second creation story there, of course, ends with us being getting into the garden and Eden, but we don't spend much time there, and we are immediately uh, actually uh, expelled from the Garden of Eden. You know, biblical historiography is pretty pessimistic. Uh, <laughs> we are expelled from the Garden of Eden. We never get a chance to return to the Garden of Eden, which uh, makes, makes us very frustrated. But biblical prophecy is much more optimistic. Biblical prophecy actually promises us that one day we will return to the Garden of Eden. I'll, I'll read just one of the two texts that I bring here. The last one, text number 21, uh, from Isaiah chapter 51, verse 3. Truly the Lord has comforted Zion. And you have to understand that Zion, in Hebrew, Zion, is related to the word Tzia, Tzia, which is desert. Jerusalem is a desert. So truly the Lord has comforted Zion, comforted all her ruins, he has made her wilderness like Eden, the desert, her desert like the garden of the Lord. Gladness and joy shall abide there, thanksgiving and the sound of music. Well, we will return to the Garden of Eden, and now you know that you are in the very right place in Jerusalem. That's the place of the new Garden of Eden. Actually, the exact place is the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. <laughs> what can I say? Let it be. Now I understand the time has already been created and I have to stop. Thank you very much. Thanks, Professor. Thank you very much. Um, Now uh, I have the pleasure, like uh, any other of the three professors that uh, preceded the presentation, but it's, this is a personal pleasure for me to introduce Rachel Elior, Professor Rachel Elior. So let me read a couple of uh, information extracted from her CV. Uh, Rachel was born in Jerusalem. Um, he has a PhD summa cum laude in 1976 from the Hebrew University and uh, held different positions in, in, in the Hebrew University and other type of uh, institutions. Uh, let me mention that since 1982, uh, Rachel uh, was lecturer in the University College of London uh, I know that uh, she also uh, visiting professor in Yeshiva University, Oxford University, Tokyo University, and I can go on and on all over the world with uh, Rachel CV. Uh, from Academics Award, he, he received the, she received the first one in 1976, the Excellence Award of the Liberal Arts Faculty of the Hebrew University, and in the last 
uh, years, he re she received three awards from the Memorial Foundation. Those who know what the Memorial Foundation is, is one of the most prestigious one in uh, Jewish Judaism education all over the world. And finally, in 2006, the Gershon Sholom Award for the study of Kabbalah and the Memorial Foundation again for Jewish Culture Fellowship. So it's my pleasure and I, you will enjoy Rachel Elior. Dear Mr. Chairman, dear members of the Board of Governors, my esteemed colleagues, it's a great pleasure to talk with you. And I would like to start by offering a very general distinction about the difference between the first session and the second session. As you know, the Hebrew University, as any other university, is divided basically between the Faculty of the Sciences and the Faculty of the Humanities. What's the nature of this distinction? In the Faculty of the Sciences, we are researching everything that we have not made. We may call it nature or we ascribe it to God, however, we certainly admit that we are not responsible on the sea and the suns, on the stars and the planet, on the process of creation. This is well known. So humbly, we are studying to the best of our capacity the mysteries of creation. That's what they're doing in the sciences and we just had the opportunity to hear how much there is to know. How did you sum it? 90% of the matter we don't know, 10% we hope to know. However, we know very well that we are studying what we, human beings, have not done. In the Faculty of the Humanities, we do exactly the other way around. We are studying everything to the best of our capacity that humans had done. We are very curious about the particular, not about the universal. Our colleagues in the sciences are interested in the universal, in the simple, in the precise. We are interested exactly in the other way. We are interested in the intricate, in the unique, in the non-universal, in the very many differences between cultures and languages, humans and literatures, because this is the most fascinating thing because the humanities are about all what humans had done, with no distinctions. Human of all cultures, humans of all religions, humans of past, humans of the, of the present, hopefully humans of the future. We are very much interested about the gap between the way things are and the way things ought to be. Great literature was talking about this gap, how things are as we observe them and how things ought to be as we believe they should be. The Bible is telling us that we should pursue justice, that we should avoid war, that we should pursue study and rest. All those are well-known things. However, it wasn't all that well-known in a period when most people in the world were slaves, where there was no day of rest, where there was no literacy for all. We need to remember that great literature is about the gap between the way things are and the way they ought to be. That's what the humanities are interested to learn. Now, I would like to talk about the issue of creation in mystical literature. In one word, what is mysticism? This is the history of the freedom of human imagination, defying the constraints of human history. It is all imagination. It's creative imagination. It is defiance against the constraints of human experience, which in the Jewish case was more often than not an experience of persecution and destruction, wars and blood libels, false charges and injustice. We had defied it in the only field where we were completely free people, in the field of human imagination. Luckily, we never had a church. Nobody ever told us what is that that we should think. We were very well told how we should behave in the Jewish law and in the external non-Jewish society. External behavior was closely monitored until the modern era. However, only in the Jewish nation, there was a complete freedom of thought. We were told that there are holy scriptures and there is freedom of interpretation. 
There is the book of God and there is the human free spirit that offers new ideas. As soon as we understood that, the first conclusion was, let us improve the holy scriptures. Let us add to them new interpretations. Let's offer an alternative way of thinking. And since, as I said, we always had enjoyed the unrestricted power of creativity, and that is a unique thing about Jewish intellectual history, since we enjoyed the power of creativity, we had used it to its excess. Now, the first story of creation after the biblical well-known story is the story of the Book of Jubilees. The Book of Jubilees was written in the second century before the Common Era, when the Jews were mastered by the Seleucians. Seleucians are Greek Syrian kings, the heir of Alexander the Great, who took over the land of Israel in the year 175 and imposed a new lunar calendar on the Jews who had a different calendar, and the Jews felt that their culture is in danger. They decided to start a new kind of story because whenever you tell a new story of creation, in fact, you tell your new perspectives on history, on culture, and on the gap between things are and as they ought to be. I would like to read to you a very challenging sentence. It's one sentence, eight line in its length. So I'm not sure if I can make it without stop to breathing, but, and don't worry if you don't follow every word, I just want you to note how the story of creation in the book of Jubilee starts, and I would say in advance, they add Jerusalem, because you see in Genesis, Jerusalem is not mentioned directly. In our Bible, Jerusalem is first mentioned in the book of Joshua. But when Jerusalem was endangered by Seleucian conquest, the writers of Jubilee's story of creation are not postponing Jerusalem to Joshua. They are bringing it to the force in the very beginning story of creation. And they are doing it in a very wise way. The second deficiency they found about Genesis, which they admired, adored, and sanctified, but there was only one thing missing there. Nobody identified the identify of the storyteller. It starts wonderfully when God had created heaven and earth, and you know Genesis 1.1. However, nobody is telling you who is telling the story. Jubilees rectified the situation and says, it is the angel of the presence who is relating the story of creation to Moses. Because poor Moses, how would he have known what had happened 2,500 years before he was born? There was no Bible there. There was no book before he was born. So who would tell the story? So the angel of the presence is the one who relates on Mount Sinai the story of creation, from creation to the Exodus, in a very concise way, in 50 chapters, which corresponds to Genesis and the 21st chapters of uh, Exodus. And it starts like that. And the angel of the presence who went before the camp of Israel took the tablets of the division of years from the time of the creation of the law and testimony according to their weeks of years, according to the jubilees, year by year throughout the full number of jubilees, from the day of creation until the day of the new creation, when the heaven and earth and all their creatures shall be renewed according to the powers of heaven and according to the whole nature of earth until the sanctuary of the Lord is created in Jerusalem upon Mount Zion. And all the lights will be renewed for healing and peace and blessings for all of the elect of Israel and in order that it might be thus from that day and unto all the days of the earth. This is all one sentence. That's the way the Jubilees start the story of creation. On the literary scales, we can certainly prefer Genesis. But Genesis does not include Jerusalem and Mount Zion. Jubilees puts Mount Zion, which was defiled by the Seleucian kings when they instituted there a golden sculpture, and puts Jerusalem that was defiled by the Seleucian kings when they demanded Antiochia to be the great uh, place of the uh, Seleucian rule. They said from the very beginning, Jerusalem and Mount Zion were the center of the things. Now they realize that something else is missing. 
The topic of the day was a new questionable calendar that was imposed on the Jews against their will by King Antiochus. The Jews said, oh no, we don't want, that second century before the Common Era, we don't want a wrong calendar. We don't want a foreign calendar. We want our calendar of freedom because the Jewish great perception from the very first page of Genesis is that while the world had been created by God forever and ever by eternal cycles, it's only human beings who can stop every seven days according to the divine pattern and count and recount and account. What does it mean? It means that we are told that every seven days we have to stop everything that we are doing, urgent as it might be, and convene together to read again, to read aloud the story of the creation of God, the story of the history of Israel, to consolidate a community of memory, a community of identity. Now, Jubilees knew all that very well. As I said, Genesis was sanctified. It only added a few more notions about the number seven. The first sentence that I read included the division of time to weeks of years, which means Shnat Shemitah, every seven years, and Jubilees, which means every seven, seven of, of years. In the following sentence, Jubilee says the following. And the angel of the presence spoke to Moses by the word of the Lord, saying, write the whole account of creation, that in six days the Lord God completed all his work and all that he created. And he observed the Sabbath, the seventh day, and he sanctified it for all ages. And he set it as a sign for all his works. Please note whether you are observant or secular, from the very story of creation, the idea of the Sabbath is a bequest to all the human race. It's not only for a particular nation, it's the idea of freedom. Every seventh day, decreed by God. You don't have to negotiate about it, you don't need it as a favor. It's a gift of freedom for all humanities. Now, for on the first day, he created the heat, that's God. For, the, for on the first day he created the heavens, which are above, and the earth and the waters and all the spirits of which minister before him. This is new because Genesis doesn't tell us that there are spirits which are ministering before the Lord. Jubilees continue to detail the nature of those spirits. Please note the beautiful connection between angels and nature. So it says, for on the first day he created the heavens which are above, and the earth and the waters and all the spirits which minister before him, the angels of the presence, and the angels of the sanctification, and the angels of the spirit of fire, and the angels of the spirit of the winds, and the angels of the spirits of the clouds, and darkness, and snow, and hail, and frost, and the angels of resoundings, and thunder, and lightning, and the angels of the spirits of cold and heat and winter and springtime and harvest and summer, and all of the spirits of his creatures which are in heaven and on earth. Now, this is very beautiful because it means that one may never disregard nature. Nature is being sanctified by the very presence of the angels in every aspect, in every aspect of the eternal natural cycles. Nature is sanctified, and in the very first covenant with Noah, we are told that eternal time cycles are to be observed, that nature should be sanctified. Very modern ecological ideas have their precedence 2,200 years ago when we are told that every aspect of nature is divinely gifted and is angelic guarded and we should be observant of it. Now, as I said, number one thing that we were told is that we have to count every seven days and every seven years, and every seven appointed holy day of the Lord, and every seven, seven of years, and those eternal cycles of freedom and eter eternal cycles of scholarly convening together are what assure us that humanity and culture and memory would proceed forever and ever, not only the natural cycles, because nature would work very well without us. The sun will rise without us, but Sabbath will never be without us. Those cycles of resigning of human sovereignty, cycles of freedom and literacy, will never take care if we will not do that, if we will not stop, if we will not sanctify, if we will not 
convene those communities of memory, identity, scholarship, and all that, that will not occur. The reason that the Jewish people are around, while many of our contemporaries from antiquities, Babylonians and Chittites, Jebusites and Prezites, Sumerian, Akkadians, and all those mighty nations, much greater than we were, all of them are not around anymore because they didn't have cycles of stopping from work, stopping from slavery, convening together, teaching the children, learning and appreciating the cycles of resigning human sovereignty in order to remember the greatness of creation and the greatness of divine grace. Now, in this third day, there is a very interesting addition to what we know from the Bible. The Bible tells us about the creation of the third day and Jubilee expands and it says, on the third day he did as he said to the waters, let them pass from the surface of the whole earth into one place and let the dry land appear. And the water did as he said, and they turn aside from upon the surface of the earth into one place outside of this firmament and dry land appeared. And on that day he created for it all the seas in each of their gathering places and all of the rivers and the gathering places of the waters on the mountains and in the earth and all of the ponds and all of the dew of the earth and the seed which is sown and everything which is eaten and trees which bear fruits and other trees. And, and here is the interesting addition, and the garden of Eden in Eden in the place of luxury, outside the circuits of the moon and the circuits of the sun, in the luxuriant earth. And everything, these four species, the Lord made on this third day. Why do I point out this paradise or garden of Eden beyond the circles of sun and moon? Because sun and moon, as you know, and as was mentioned by my colleague, were created only on Wednesday while paradise was created on Tuesday. It means that Garden of Eden is beyond time and space. Time and space are not affecting the eternity of paradise. This very idea that there is time before time and space before space is very, very fantastic because it makes us to wonder, what does it mean time before time? What does it mean creation before time? Because please note that human time can start only on Wednesday when there is sun and moon. Thus the Jewish calendar of old in antiquity would always start on the first of the first on Wednesday on the day of the vernal equinox. That is the month of freedom. That's the month of exodus of Egypt. That's the month when human were granted freedom and time could be counted. No day could be counted before Wednesday because Wednesday is the days of the luminaries. For us humans, time is accountable only where we observe sun and moon, day and night. That's for us signification of time. But for God, paradise was created before the sun and the moon. Thus, there is a way of thinking about time which is not connected with day and night time spans of human calculation, there is, eternal, there is eternal sphere that might be used for all kinds of important things. Now you may ask, what was the most important thing that this paradise was used for? You'll be amazed to know that that was the place where the seventh of the human generation was taken up to in order to learn to read, write, and calculate. The name of this very important person was Enoch, son of Jared. In Hebrew, Chanoch. All of you who knows Hebrew, you know that Chinuch means education. Chanoch was the first educated man who was taken to paradise to learn from the angels. The angels are those who live in paradise and those who bequest knowledge of letters, numbers, reading and counting and accounting for the first human being who was the first teacher, the first high priest, according to the legendary myst mystical tradition. But the question that this legendary tradition offers is how did, I'm sorry, how did humans start to read and write? The mystical answer is very interesting one. They learn it from angels in paradise. That's as good an answer as any other because we have no idea 
how somebody had written such a wonderful sentence as Yair Zakovich was reading, referring in the beginning of Genesis. How does this very excellent sentence, in the beginning God had created heaven and earth, and the wind was, you know, you remember the beautiful beginning of Genesis, when the Spirit of God was hovering above the water and the abyss and all that. How did that happen? You can't start by writing such a sentence. Somebody must have taught someone to write it. We don't know exactly the history of tuition and the history of literacy, but the mystical idea is that the first human who was taken to paradise where eternal wisdom was kept was taught to read and write by the angels. I would stop here about the creation, of the creation story of Jubilees, and I would just say that Jubilees was very much interested in the idea of creating time before time and on expanding human knowledge and human spirit in connection with the angels. I would like to tell you about the second creation story, which is utterly different, entirely unknown. It is called the Book of Creation, Sefer Yetzirah. It's an unicum. We don't know who wrote it. We don't know where it was written. We don't know exactly on what circumstances. We know only one thing. It was written in Hebrew, in unique Hebrew. Scholars are conflicting about the question whether it was in the first century or the sixth century. It doesn't really matter. We know it was written in the first millennium. And we know that they start to tell again a new, a story of creation, which brought something entirely new to the consideration. The story of creation, of the book of creation, anon anonymously written, tells us that creation, in fact, started in an entirely different way. I'll read this very beautiful long sentence of creation, and I'll explain it a little later. In 32 wondrous passes of wisdom, engraved Yah, the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, the living God, El Shaddai, high and exalted, dwelling all the way to the heights, whose name is holy, and he created this world through three books, through Sefer, book, and Sfar, number, and Sipur, story. Ten Sfirot, or ten digits, or ten spheres, Ten sphirot of infinite nothingness and 22 principal letters. Ten sphirot of infinite nothingness, 10 and not 9, 10 and not 11. Understanding wisdom and search with understanding. Analyze with them and search with them. Know and contemplate and create and establish things on its entirety, truth and and restore the creator to his place. Because he creates and crafts by himself, and there is no one else, and it, in its measures are 10, and they have no end. 10 spheres of nothingness. Stop your heart from contemplating and stop your mouth from talking. And if your heart runs, return to the place about which it was said, and the living creatures run back and forth. And because of this, the covenant was enacted. Ten spheres of infinite nothingness. Its end is connected to its beginning, and its beginning to its end, as the fire is connected to the burning coal. Know and think and create. The master is one, and the creator is one, and no one else is comparable with him. And in front of the one, what are you counting? Ten spheres of infinite nothingness. Their measure is 10, and they have no end. Depths of beginning and depths of an end. Depths of good and depths of evil. Depths of the top and depths of the bottom. The depths of east and the depths of west. The depths of north and the depths of south. And only one master, lord, faithful king, ruling over all from his sacred dwelling place for all eternity. This is the beginning of the book of creation. Even if we can't follow every sentence, only the first one I would like you to note. In 32 wondrous passes of wisdom, engraved Yah, the Lord of hosts, God of Israel, and so on, and he created his world through three books. 
through Sefer, book, and Sfar, or Sifra, number, and Sipu, story. There is an entirely new perception of creation. What are 32 paths of wisdom? It's the accumulation of 10 numbers and 22 letters, the very first 10 digits which are known to us, and the 22 Hebrew letters. Now, what is it noticeable about that? Because in the Genesis story of creation, we are at the most obedient listeners, curious listeners. We may appreciate the beauty, the marvel, the genius of the creation, but we know only too well that we are not participating in the very process because we cannot form suns, moons, and planets. However, in the book of creation, story of creation, when the world was created by its very beginning definition, by 32 passes of wisdom, which are explained as 22 infinite letters and 10 endless digits. There, we are also a part. We also understand letters. We also understand numbers. Now, there might be an inherent difference between the letters of the divine creation, which unite speech and action, thought, speech, and action. We don't. We have to think separately, talk uh, separately, and do differently. However, while for the divine unity, speech, thought, and action are one, for the human thought, speech is available, thought is available, and action is available, and all of them are result of letters and numbers. The very idea that letters and numbers are the factors of creation make us participants in the divine, glorious story of creation in an unprecedented way. Now, what does it mean? Just exactly as creation is infinite, just exactly as creation is marvelous, we may participate in the marvelous story of creation because we may add to it. As soon as we search, as soon as we study, as soon as we impart knowledge, as soon as we create knowledge, as soon as we contemplate of those marvels that we did not create, as soon as we give them words, as soon as we realize that there are planets which are not there yet, and as soon as we understand that there are powers which we don't name yet, but we will name, as soon as we understand that the transcendent is the horizon and not only the tangible, as soon as we understand that there is no end to human freedom and to human creativity, exactly as there is no end to the powers of nature. Then we are part of the story of creation. The book of creation is a book which has only three folios, no more. It's not really a book, it's rather a booklet. Thousand pages, the whole entire mystical library. It's footnotes to the book of creation. The idea that letters and numbers are divine and are shared by humans are the very foundation of Kabbalah, the very foundation of this huge defiance of the human spirit against the constraint of history and evil and cruelty. The idea that wisdom is unlimited, that the transcendence is perceived by human imagination, that creativity is divine and human alike, was espoused by the human race from antiquity and by the Jewish people from the, third, from the second millennium before the common era. When we were told that the words of God are written on the tablets, immediately we started to add to them, to interpret them, to refashion them, to retell them. When did we do it especially? In times of strife and time of words. In the 13th century, when the Jewish people were nearly, nearly devastated in the end of two centuries of the Crusades between 1096 to 1296. People in Spain, the Jewish community of Spain that was less harmed relatively by the Crusaders had forged together a new perception of creation, entirely different. Then they said, it is not the old creation story that we know it which is suffice. We need to create an entirely new an entirely new story of creation, when we would realize that there is a purpose to all what we suffer. There is a God of history, although he seems so far and transcendent, much more than the God of nature. Because in the beauty of nature, we share thank God every day. But in the harshness of history, 
we seem, at least as the Jews of 2,000 years of exile, about the harshness of history, can, we can do very, very little other than educate our children, convene a community, teach that there would be a day when there would be no more war and one nation will not lift a sword onto the another nation. In our divine imagination, there are no swords and there is no rifle. There are no teomachia and there, is no, there are no wars between gods. In our perception, there were spirits of ruchot emet, ruchot da'at emet vetzedek bekodesh kodeshim, spirits of knowledge, truth, and justice in the Holy of Holies, as we are told in the songs of the Sabbath liturgy found in Qumran 60, 60 years ago. But when Albert Einstein, not knowing, of course, about the Qumran finding, which did not occur at this time, when Albert Einstein was asked, what is that that makes you proud to be a Jew? He said, because I'm a member of a nation that always pursued knowledge, truth, and justice. Those are exact words of the songs of the Sabbath liturgy that said, the poet said to the angels, they are spirits of knowledge, truth, and justice in the Holy of Holies. There where the Jews had left them forever in order to pursue them time and again. In the days of the Crusades, after the Crusades, when most of the Jews of Germany and France were exterminated, when the only tiny Jewish community of Spain was left, the people in Gerona, in Segovia, in Barcelona, were writing the following stories, which starts with a new story of creation. Their story of creation is very strange and very complicated. That's what starts what we call Kabbalah. Kabbalah is the defiance of human spirits against human atrocity. So they start. At the head of potency of the king, he engraved engravings in luster on high. A spark of Im impenetrable darkness flashed within the concealed of the concealed from the head of infinity, a cluster of vapor forming in formlessness, thrust in a ring, not white, not black, not red, not green, no color at all. Remember the beautiful slides that we were shown before? It sounds like this description. A cluster of vapor forming in formlessness, thrust in a ring, not white, not black, not red, not green, no color at all. As a cord surveyed, it yielded radiant colors. Deep within the spark gushed a flow, splaying colors below, concealed within the concealed of the mystery of the infinite. It split and did not split its aura. Was not known at all until under the impact of splitting a single concealed supernal point shone. Beyond that point, nothing is known, so it is called beginning first command of all. Now it goes on and on, I can read the whole book, but it wants to impart the sense of the infinite, of the endlessness, of the divine structure of history which seems to have utterly unstructured and chaotic. There is a reason, there is a rhythm, there is a number, because the whole mystical tradition is about structures and numbers as against chaotic historical experience. The beauty of wisdom, imagination, and freedom is the, sum, is the summing up of the idea that there are no constraints to the human spirit and there is no end to the desired freedom to learn, to ponder, to study, to search, to create, to name, to count, account, and recount. Please remember that when you study, every nation has its own heritage. Every nation has its own stories, mythologies, memories, and communal values. In the case of the Jewish people, the idea that every seven days we have to stop from everything we're doing in order to read aloud for the benefit of all the community, to educate our children six days of the week, much before they grow up, in order to go to work, we believed in literacy, freedom, imaginary perception, and pursuing truth, knowledge, and justice. Thank you very much.
Well, we have um, time for a couple of questions. Uh, everyone to raise any. Uh, we have a mic. Thank you very much for uh, two very exciting lectures. Um, I have a question which is addressed mainly to the first speaker, but also to the second one. And it has to do with the themes which repeat themselves in the myths of creation. One theme is the number seven. The number seven which repeats itself again and again as a kind of a holy number, kind of a very special number the number of the days of creation and the number of the days they took to encircle Jericho, and it repeats itself again and again. In fact, in the Bible, number seven has become synonymous with also the word for oath, for taking the oath. And uh, <clears throat> my of course, there are theories about why it is the number seven, not the number eight or six or some other number. And some theories say it is because of the seven orifices of the human face. Uh, other theories talk about the seven planets which were known in antiquity. Um, and my question is whether this number seven, in your opinion, um, and I'm addressing this to both speakers, whether this number seven, in fact, uh, had to do uh, psychologically with this kind of relationship of ancient people who composed these texts, either to their own body or to the universe in which they lived. The second question, if I may, has to do with uh, the parting of the waters, which is another theme. As you can tell, in, for example, the story of Marduk and Tiamat, there's not only water, there's also blood. And according to some theories, again, this has to do with the uh, fact of the human birth, because in the human birth, you have water and blood, both. Uh, so the question is whether uh, the um, attitude to the human birth has to do uh, with those myths of creation. And just one very brief last question has to do with the number 10. Um, why is it that the number 10 was so special uh, to the people who composed the Book of Jubilees and to the people who composed other texts of uh, Jewish mysticism? Thank you very much. Wow, what a question. Um, well, I, I'm afraid I have to disappoint you. I cannot really answer your questions, but as far as the numbers are concerned, as I said, the number seven was already a very important number in the ancient Near East, not just in our culture, Babylonian literature, Canaanite literature. But it's not only number seven, it's also number 10, also number three. I could have given lectures about the importance of number, number three in the Bible, about the importance of num number 10 in the Bible, and I have no idea. It's, uh, perhaps it's really a question for psychologists to deal with the importance of these specific numbers. I don't know. Okay. I will try to answer from the mystical tradition. Only in Hebrew, the word seven has the meaning of oath, shvua, and covenant. The very first page of the Bible tells us that time should be counted in units of seven. This is the particular unit of Jewish time. That being said in the very beginning of the Bible, but it's not only counting, it is the idea that it's counting of cycles of freedom which could be observed only by human beings because nature doesn't have any closing stops. Nature is permanent and perpetual. It is changing on cyclical order on various ways, but it never stops. The right of stopping, the right of counting in order to stop is only a human right according to a divine decree. This is the very foundation of freedom, and we need to remember that. So the word oath, shvua, and the word seven, sheva, is the very foundation of perpetual cycles of freedom. And even people who know, know a one word of the Bible benefit for the last three millennia and more from the idea that seven is the guarantee of free time for freedom, rest, scholarship, communal convening, and the other things that we discussed before. About the number 10. 
10 is in the important number from the Ten Commandments, of course. And since God chose to decree Ten Commandments, 10 is a classical number for the Jewish uh, tradition. But in the history of mysticism, they are talking on 10 infinite spheres, pointing out that every number at the very same time has the dialectics of being finite and infinite. They say 10 numbers of in Esser Sfirot Blima, 10 numbers or 10 digits or 10 grades of infinite nature. Those very 10 numbers that each child of us knows to count as soon as one counts his own fingers. We can make various connections on the different parts of the bodies and the different ideas of numbers, but the one thing that matter is that among all species on earth, only humans were blessed with the capacity to count, account, and recount. And numbers are always those which point to us, to point to us the, con the connection between the finite and the infinite, the dialectic of creation and annihilation. We know the infinity of numbers from quite a long time ago. The more we learn, the more we ponder into that, the more we are getting closer to understanding the infinite secrets and cycles of creation. Another question? Yeah? For a minute. The question comes from the opposite of the mic. Yeah, it's coming, coming, coming. With one book of creation, Louder, please. With one book of creation, the Torah, we are advised to study, dig, and delve into it. How come that the mysticals advise us that for the Zohar, if you cannot study it, just hold it in your hand, even without opening just hold it and uh, stay with it for a little while every day oh, do me a favor please can you repeat louder because here we we cannot hear sorry uh, what about now just slowly and louder please and now now is better okay my question is why with the Torah, we are advised to dig and delve into it, to study it with all our hearts. How come that the Zohar, we are advised by Hasidim, mystics, to hold it in our, among our hands, in our hands, just once a day, every single day, and that would be enough to absorb its meaning. I'm not sure where from you take the definition of holding it in one's heart, but the idea is it is, a like, a defin it is like a saying in the book of creation that one should think and ponder and contemplate before one puts it into words. They are talking on the dialectic of thinking, of contemplating, thinking, imploring, exploring, creating, interpreting, saying don't think that word is only what is written on the page. Every word is like an iceberg. It has a long, long tail of meanings, of possibilities, of opposites. It's the very work with words which the mystical tradition is offering its readers. And it says the very beginning of that work is not reading it fast, not in, not in, like, uh, in a running car, but reading it very slowly, thinking on every word, distract it into letters, unite it into its opposite, read it from left to right, from right to left, from above to beyond, play with letters. What Austin Reed called it, how to do things with words, that's exactly what the mystical tradition is offering. It does not preach secrecy, it preaches thinking and contemplation. It had become a secret tradition only after the messianic rapture of the 17th century when the Jews were 
after Sabbatianism and the rabbi's advice to restrain the mystical tradition for the illuminated circles, which of course immediately had made it bestsellers because before some people were interested and others were not. As soon as it was prohibited, it had become the interest of every Jew illiterate or not. Thank you. Last question. Come, yep. I, I'm not going to make a profound question. It's only that I'm Ashkenaz and married to a Sephardic. I have always heard, and everybody says, ah, you can never uh, mention the number five. Five is like uh, something bad, something that you, uh, you, you wish someone something bad or some, never say five. Well, what does that mean? Not in, our community. Uh, not in our community. You know that we have five books of the Torah and the rabbis make it very clear that even the book of Psalms is divided into five books. The same way Moses gave us the five books of the Torah, David gave us the five books of, uh, of uh, Psalms. So for us, the number five is a perfect number. Perfect. Thank I, you. I would add to that only one sentence. Every number has the infinite capacity to be interpreted and to be associated. In Hebrew and in Judaism, we don't have any evil numbers. The 13 is the Christianity contribution, or 66 as a bad number is Christianity. In Judaism, all numbers are considered to be divine. All counting is considered to be divine and human intellect concern. And combining numbers, analyzing numbers, and relating to them in an abstract way and concrete way is certainly one of the best heritage of the Jewish tradition. All numbers are welcome, all letters are welcome. Freedom of creating and recreating them is our heritage. Thank you. Um, I want to thank every one of you because you came very early after a night that we have a nice meeting yesterday. I want to thank again Professor Elior, Professor Sakovich, Professor Sari, and Professor Dekel. And as I started this meeting, uh, we enjoy breadth and depth in science. We enjoy breadth and depth in the traditional Bible and literature and knowledge. And I think we enjoy breadth and depth in the connection of those two worlds. Thank you very much. <laughs>